Thank you. Welcome to night two of Untangling the Mess. And for those that you, of you that missed it last night or we need a little catch up, so we're gonna do, we're gonna talk about uh, some of the stuff we talked about last night. And what we learned over and over and over are there's words that probably banged around in your head last night. Patriarchy, procreation, and penetration, right? Those are the ones we talked about. And good sex all through history, and we're not talking about the quality of sex, we're talking about appropriate, acceptable sex all through history, has been procreative. So it actually, it has to at least have the intention of producing a baby. It has to be male dominant, and male dominant means that the man is being the, the penetrator, but penetrator where it's procre procreative, so penis, vagina, sex. And, it's, um, and, and some people even believed that the male had to be on top, so one position. And it had to be controlled, sex had to be controlled and devoid of lust or excess. So no passion attached to sex. So if that's the kind of sex you're having, great. Through most of history, you would have been having good, appropriate sex. But I'm guessing that a lot of people don't have procreative, only male dominant sex without passion or lust in it, right? I'm, I'm hoping, guessing. Um, there were two people weren't considered to be the male or the female in sex. They were considered to be taking either the male or masculine role or the female or feminine role. You could be a male and be taking the female or feminine role, right? You could be, if you were penetrated, you were taking the female or feminine, feminine role. Sex was something you did to somebody. Sex is not something you did with somebody. Women were placed in the social sexual role um, of being submissive and penetrated. See, I say penetrated a lot, I should count. My friend Sarah said we should have made a drinking game out of it. You know, <laughs> you'd, you'd all be on the floor, let me tell you. Um, so women, until about the 1700s, were the lusty sexual temptresses. And about the, the 1700s, they, their role changed to the chaste and pure virgins. And then in the 1910s and 20s, during the Roaring Twenties, women started to get out a little bit more, unchaperoned dating, sexual interest. Uh, 1950 was the second wave of feminism, and that challenged 12,000 years of patriarchal social organization. And that's why it has felt so comfortable. So when there are groups of people that um, want to make the United States like it used to be, and, <laughs> and what they're hearkening back to is essentially the 1950s, when the social sexual roles as they were, men and women were in their proper roles, certain kinds of people had control, but that's what they're hearkening back to, the 1950s. There's an interesting book um, one of my favorite uh, social historians is a woman named uh, Stephanie Coons, and she wrote a book called The Way We Never Were. It's really an eye-opener to read a book about the 40s and 50s, especially about women, and all these pictures and ideas we have about, you know, you know the, the shows we used to see, the Donna Reed shows, My Three Sons, those kind of shows. We have a picture about what it used to be, but when you look at the real demographics, about how women were suffering during those times, the amount of depression, alcohol, taking pills because they were so unhappy. The, those are the kinds of books that really should be read about social, social history of women. Uh, so women started challenging uh, the patriarchy, gender hierarchy, uh, the ro those roles started to falling apart in the 50s and 60s. Um, then we also looked at the influence of the military decisions in the 30s and 40s on what homosexuality, why homosexuality was banned in the military, um, and the impact of the, uh, the RSV changing those words, changing the words arsenicoite and malakoite to one word, homosexual, for the first time in the history of any Bible. So we looked at all of those roles, but so the, some of the words we looked at, though, we, we started by looking at, in 1862, those are kind of the social things, what, did, what were the scientists looking at? In 1862, there was a man named Carl Uricks, and Carl Uricks, he had a wife that we would call a lesbian, and she seemed to have feelings for women, and some of the people around him were not sexual, heterosexual normatives, we would say, but there were 
in the mix, there were heterosexuals, homosexuals, transgender people. We never would have used those words. But he started noticing that there were those kinds of people. And so he said, hmm, there seems to be men that have this sense of being a woman inside of them, and women, uh, so that they are having the attractions for men. But it was this, m m this placement of a feeling. So if the feeling for women was placed in a man that had attractions for women, he was called a true man. But if a feeling for a man was placed in a man, and he was attracted to a man, he was called an earning. Just a word he created, an earning. So in 1868, then there's a guy that comes along, and his name is Carl Kurt Benny. Kurt Benny. And he writes, uh, he's thinking about the same things, and he writes to Carl Uricks, and he says, I'm noticing that there's a distinction in the ways people are attracted to. So before this point, it was always the role you took in, in sex that defined you. Did you take the male masculine role, or did you take the feminine female role? Did you take the penetrator role? Did you take the penetrated role, right? So it's not really about who you are as a male or a female, it's the role you took. So it was always all through history, back here, back the entire way. It's been about the role you took in sex. Well, he says that he, there seemed to him to be several ways that people were having sex. They were either heteros... He, he coined the words. The words were coined in 1868. He coined the words heterosexual, those were people that were having sex with the opposite sex, with the same sex, with children, and with animals. But what was associated with it was this excess, because there were also normal sexuals that handled sex with control and only having sex with women. Most of the time we're going to talk about men because women just haven't mattered through much of history. So there were normal sexuals as opposed to heterosexuals. Heterosexuals just had sex with whoever they wanted, and there was always lust and excess involved. Natural sexuals had sex with the opposite sex. And then there were homosexuals that had sex with the same sex. And then there were heterogenets that had sex with animals. And then there were monosexuals that had sex with themselves. They were masturbators. So, and then the next distinction is a guy in 1869, not much longer, a guy named Carl Westf um, Westfall. And he calls this thing inside of people, this attraction inside of people. So for the first time ever, it's not about the role you play in sex, which is ha has been all through history. It's about who you're attracted to. Big switch. Big, big switch. So Carl Westfeld, a year later, he wants to call this thing inside of people that's attracted to the same sex, he wants to call this thing a contrary sexual feeling because it's contrary to what it should be, and it's contrary to procreative purposes. So he calls that contrary sexual feelings, and he also calls him those people sexual inverts. And that makes sense, because their sexuality is inverted on the inside. And that term sexual invert played through the 1950s. And the next person in our historical timeline of soci uh, psychologists, psychoanalysts that dealt with this was 1893, and his name was Richard von Kraft Ebbing. And he looks at heterosexuality, too, but he calls it hetero-sexuals. And he says, now, what's causing this? Before him, the people just said, this is. Kurt Benny didn't think there was anything wrong with it. Ulrichs didn't think there was anything wrong with it. They observed that there just happened to people, these people that were doing sex differently that just are. But now, von Kraft Ebbing comes along, and he says, no, this is contrary to what it should be because there's no procreation associated with it. And if there's no procreation associated with it, it must be a mental illness. Well, what could possibly call this, cause this mental illness? And he comes up with masturbation. So masturbation causes, causes all kinds of mental illness. It causes epilepsy. It causes blindness. We all heard, we probably heard that one as kids. It causes, it causes your brain to inflame, and it actually causes early death. So beware. You heard it here from this altar. Beware. Um, the next person that comes along is Havelock Ellis. And um, I didn't mention this last night, I forgot this. He, he's in 1897, Havelock Ellis. He's a British sex es expert. I've mentioned him, but I didn't mention how he shows up again later. Havelock Ellis writes, he says, um, 
homosexuality is a sex, sexual deviance, but it's not a mental illness. So he, he admits it's a deviance. He also thinks it's called, caused by max masturbation. He's one of the first people, though, that unhinges the act of sex from the procreative act. He says people can actually have sex not to the intent of procreation. And so he became famous for that. He wrote a book in 1910 that talked about that. It was quite a stir. So in the records, when we were checking through the Revised Standard Version, um, because I know some of this history, we, when I was going through some of the letters from some of the people in the translation team to other people on the translation team, these guys didn't sit down and write about, here are our sexual ethics, here are why, here's why we did these translations. They, they just happened. So you have to look for tiny clues throughout their correspondence. And there was just one phrase from, um, from the head of the, the, the team, Luther Weigel, who's the main person we're looking at, and he writes to another person on the team because they're now, they're also dealing with other um, translations in the New Testament that have to do with porneia, you know, por pornography, porneia, sexual sins. And he says, he says this, he says, we are not going the way of Havelock Ellis on sexual is issues. So that told me that Luther Weigel very much believed in the good sex model. And the good sex model is sex towards procreation, right? Male dominance and sexual excess or lust is out of the equation. So that tells me a lot about him when he says to someone else, we are not going the way of Havelock Ellis. Next person that you can't, you can't talk about uh, sexuality without talking about Freud, Sigmund Freud. He starts thinking about, too, why people are homosexuals. He puts a, a period at the end of the sentence and says, what Havelock Ellis starts and he says, sex is not only for procreation. There's this thing called libido where you're supposed to enjoy sex and sex is supposed to be enjoyable. And so people that are enjoying sex are not, don't have a mental illness. So, and he normalizes heterosexual sex. Whereas heterosexuals before, remember, were different than normal sexuals. Normal sexuals did it in control with procreation. Heterosexuals are now having sex with excess, with lust, not towards procreation. Well, he normalizes it. He says, this is normal stuff. And there was also a little point in there where he, he also looked at women that were enjoying sex and accused women of having mental illness because they were enjoying sex. Because the model had been that women had been these pure, chaste, virginal things like, you know, Mother Mary, and we were coming out of the Victorian area. So we're in a period where sex is now unhinged from procreation and sex is allowed to be enjoyed. So that's 1934, where in the first time in a, in a dictionary in America, um, uh, sex, uh, heterosexuality is called normal sexuality. So it took that long. So it took 60 something years from the, when the word was created heterosexual was not normal sexuality, right? It had lust and non-procreative intentions attached to it for it to become, in the dictionary, normal sexuality. So when you make heterosexuality normal sexuality, you've always got to have a yin and a yang. Homosexuality, because it was non-procreative mostly, mostly right then, was a sexual deviance, a mental illness. We don't know what it's caused by, glandular dysfunction, smother mother, distant father, too much masturbation, rejected love in their youth, all kinds of reasons, but nobody knew. It was a big old mystery. So that's when the translation team of the RSV starts to do their work, and they do their work, and they take these two Greek words, which one of them is arsenikoitai, and that word means to have sex with, an, most importantly, to exploit or abuse someone through sex, but it's an exploitative and a, an abusive act. It could go both ways. Both parties could be using each other. And the other word is malakoi, and this word means to have the dreadful dispositions of a woman. You know, a liar, a cheater, an unchaste person, because this is an ancient culture, that's how women were seen. So the RSV team takes those two words, combine them up into one word, and the word they think best suits that is homosexual. Yeah, that's, that's a travesty. Okay. So where we stopped last night 
was um, after telling the story of the seminarian and seeing that nobody else seemed to notice that this word was in the Bible for the first time. I'd gone through lists. I couldn't find um, even a blip. And I did mention this, too. There was, um, in 1960, I think the, ni- words, the year is 1960, Lewis, uh, Luther Weigel, with another author, wrote a book. can't remember the title. It's on my desk. But it was a book that said people were still struggling. The fundamentalists were struggling that they took their King James away from them. So they were trying to get people to be comfortable with having their King James taken away from them. So they co-authored a book, 500-page book-ish, and this book had all the words that had changed from the King James to the Revised Standard Version, but history in it. So it wasn't just word change, word change, word change. Lots of history in it. Lots of, this is why, this is what that word meant there. This is why they've changed it. So it's also a historical book. And in those lists of words, nowhere on those lists is either the word sodomy or homosexual. So they have done a diligent job of all the words they've changed, and they ignore these two words that are so important to us, which I find absolutely stunning. It was completely under their radar. No one reacted to it except the three people I noticed, I told you about a seminarian, a pastor in New Brunswick, Canada, and uh, Derek Sherwin-Bailey. That was it. So that's where we stopped. So why, why were people so distracted and didn't notice this unbelievable change in the Bible? One of the things they were very much distracted by was communism. How can that be, right? So there were very public attacks on uh, the RSV Bible, and people were absolutely convinced. So there was this whole group that was really irritated that the RSV was not fundamentalist enough for them anymore. Like they took the virginity of Mary away, that was the the supposition. And the centurion at at the cross said, surely this is a son of God instead of the son of God. But they were going with the language. They were trying to be really accurate to what the language told them, and not to go with denominational swings or theology. They, they prided themselves, the team did, on being really good linguists. And so that was their job as translators, was to be really good linguists. So people were saying they took the deity, you know, you took the deity of Christ away from us, and you took the virginity of Mary away from us with some word changes. Well, that was that camp that were pretty irritated. But there was another camp of people that were accusing the RSV team of being involved in either communism or communist sympathizers. Um, This was, so it was a huge distraction. This Bible came out in 1952. It was during the McCarthy scare. And people were caught up, Americans were really caught up in all kinds of anxieties. And otherwise sensible people just started listening to paranoia stories. Even when I was a kid, this was still rolling around in the early 60s, still in the early 60s in New York City. I mean, we had our fallout shelters, and we all knew where they were, and we had our duck and cover drills at my Roman Catholic school, Good Shepherd, because we we, we knew the communists were coming to get us still in the 1960s. I remember crazed paranoias in my neighborhood in New York. I remember when I was very little and watching the people run from alleyway to doorway, and there was a sex fiend in my neighborhood. A peeping Tom went to Carol Maloney's window and peeked in, and the neighbor went crazy because we were just in this crazy paranoia. Sex fiends, communists, homosexuals, they're all rolled together, and they're all out to get all of us, especially the women and children. These stories should sound fairly familiar with, you know, transgender people are out to do this now, right? So we got caught up in this paranoia, and there were two characters that kept popping up in the archives. One was a fringe Presbyterian minister, and uh, he didn't like the National Council of Churches that sponsored part of the work for the RSV, and he wrote uh, just an absolutely dreadful pamphlet on the RSV, and when I read it, I think I've got a copy back in the hotel, but when I read it, I was so surprised at how many lies were in this. People were just producing lies, but he really convinced people that the RSV team was filled with communists and communist sympathizers. So that starts 
uh, turning people away uh, 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 against this Bible because we are just so sure that the communists are using this Bible to infiltrate our families and churches. I mean, it sounds crazy, but the articles are amazing when you read them. And then there was another man that was very interesting. His name is Dan Gilbert, 1955. He wrote a pamphlet, um, and he, he, his pamphlet was this um, real debate between a professor, George Stevenson, and himself. And he, of course, starred in this debate. And this debate took place in XYZ Place. And during this debate, Professor Stevenson, who was on the team, um, admitted that the reason that they wrote so much um, anti-deity and all these other principles, these communist principles into the Bible, into the RSV, was because so much of the world was communist that they were trying to reach out to them through the RSV. So, but it came out that Professor George Stevenson was not on the translation team. It was a comp the debate never happened ever. The city that it supposedly happened in never existed. And this man sold tens and hundreds of thousands of this pamphlet. And we were in a paranoia. And people started to believe that the RSV was part of a communist project and that nine members out of the 12 on the RSV team were either communists or communist sympathizers. This sounds ridiculous, but the press in the, in the records is absolutely astounding. So much so that when, in 1960, the Air Force Reserve wrote um, their training manual and they warned the recruits to avoid the communist RSV Bible in the U.S. Air Force training manual. That's how deeply this, this lie went. So the accu accusations were debated. They were completely unfounded, but the true believers were never dissuaded. They believed that the RSV was a communist Bible. So there were people that just wouldn't engage the RSV. So all this um, fear surrounding the RSV totally distracted people from this other thing that to us is so important, that this word homosexual for the first time in any language is in the Bible but it distracted people, and I found it interesting that the only three people that seemed to notice that this word is in there and commented on it were two Canadians and an Englishman outside the country. They weren't caught up in our um, paranoia. Okay, so that's, that's the last part in the RSV for now. And the next piece I want to talk about is, okay, so now we see what's happening. Uh, we've, we know kind of where we are in the mental health area. Um, mental hygiene became a term that was used in about the 1930s and 1940s. It sounds like it should have been a, lighter t a later term, but mental hygiene, so we can use that term here. So we know where mental hygiene is on human sexuality, mentally ill. Um, we know where the culture is. The culture is starting to stretch a little bit about what do we do about women, because as I've said before, before there were gays, there were women, and that's going to be a, a storyline that brings through the 70s and 80s. Before there were gays, there were women. Some people were paying attention to gays. Some people were still focused on how do we keep the little lady at home, very unsuccessfully. And, and then so back into the medical community now, how are they starting to deal with this? There was a woman named Evelyn Hooker. And when she was young, uh, she went through, I think, the University of Colorado, and she was an au pair or a nanny for a, a psychiatrist and his family. And the psychiatrist happened to notice that she was actually pretty good at the stuff that he was teaching. So he said, why don't you go to school and to study psychology? So she tried to get into a psychology school. It was very difficult. She already had an undergraduate, but she wanted to go to, uh, I think she wanted to go to Harvard or Yale. I always skip, mix which one she wanted to go to. She wanted to go to one of them. And her professor that she was studying under to get her doctorate, the professor she was studying under had gotten his doctorate from the same place and wouldn't even write a recommendation for a letter for her in the 30s because she's a woman. So she finally gets her, her doctorate. She comes back to L.A. She wants to teach at UCLA. And they wouldn't hire her for the day school because they already had a woman on staff. You know, you got one, that's all you need. So they hired her for night school. And in night school, she met this guy named Sammy Fromm who was her best and brightest student, and was, you know, she wanted to get to know him, and he at one point 
brought her out socially with his cousin George. Cousin George was his partner, but this was the 50s, and so Sammy Fromm didn't want to say, this is my partner, but Evelyn Hooker's husband said, you know, he is a homosexual. I mean, he did everything but fly out the window at dinner. He is a homosexual. She's like, how could I miss this? So she started to become friendly with Sammy after the class was over, and Sammy said to her, you know us so well, everybody calls us mentally ill, no one's ever done any studies on us, you have the capability because you've got the degree, why don't you do a study on us? Nobody, nobody in 1950 had ever done any kind of scientific studies on who homosexuals were compared to heterosexuals. The assumption was that they were mentally ill. So she got three uh, psychology tests together, Rorschach, something called a MAP test and another test. She even got the creators of those tests to review the test scores with her. She picked 30 heterosexuals, 30 homosexuals. She made them fairly equal. Uh, equal status, uh, economics, uh, education. She tried to get them as equal as possible, the groups. And then she handed these tests back to the creators of the tests and said, give me the homosexuals, and they couldn't. So it's the first time ever that there was a study, and they couldn't separate scientifically on some kind of uh, aptitude, mental hygiene tests, sexual deviance tests. They couldn't separate the homosexuals out from the heterosexuals. So she's the first person that had the information. It took her a few years to do this paper. It was funded by the brand, new, brand newly minted National Institute of Mental Health. They funded it inside of the institution. They thought it was kind of a funny project that she was doing because, you know, what could come of this? And they called it the Fruit Project, disparagingly. And so she, in 1956, presented this paper to the American Psychological Association to an absolute hush room because it was the first time ever that there was scientific evidence that heterosexuals and homosexuals were no different um, in mental health, mental hygiene. And it was a woman presenting the paper, so the paper went nowhere. Uh, next few years, some things start to happen. The paper gets buried, okay? Completely, it gets buried. 1969, the National Institute of Mental Health comes back to her and says, it seems that homosexuals are starting to... The word coming out of the closet wasn't really a, a term then, but we would say coming out of the closet. It was not the popular term. People would sometimes say dropping a hairpin because, you know, the hairpins would pop out of it. It was just a term they were using, dropping a hairpin. And uh, some people were using coming out of the closet, but we understand it as that. So homosexuals are coming out of the closet. Some of the gay rights movement has started, 1965, 66, 68, 69. There's some movements going on. National Institute of Mental Health says, we need your help. Tell us what to do with these homosexuals. So she writes a paper, repeats her findings, it gets submitted back to the National Institute of Mental Health, which is under, it's a federal organization, it's under the Nixon administration. But at the time, civil war, or civil rights is going on, women's rights, um, uh, um, hippies movement, and the last thing they wanted, it was, the, the 60s was um, really interesting. It just, it, there were so many assassinations of political figures and public, it really felt, I mean, although I was a young girl, I was in my teens, um, it was just a time of such unrest. And Nixon didn't want, it was him, he didn't want the homosexuals getting into this, this Civil Rights Act too. He made the decision to bury uh, Evelyn Hooker's paper. So the paper gets buried. But it gets buried into these archives, but in those archives, there's always a clever gay hiding. So there's clever gays everywhere, and there was a clever gay in there, and they took a, a copy of the paper and they published it in an underground magazine. So suddenly, for the first time ever, gay rights activists, and there were some, had the documentation that they needed to say that we're not mentally ill. So they start trying to get into these conferences. The first one they went into, they, somebody from the inside gave them from band, some badges and they rushed the place, rushed, all three of them rushed the place. And, but there were gay therapists inside the APA too. So there was this pressure coming from the inside, but you couldn't say you were gay and get licensed. 
And in the American Psychoanalytical Association, you couldn't even apply for licensure as a psychoanalyst or psychotherapist until 1999, if you were gay. So the APA was a little looser, but so this pressure's coming from the inside. They call themselves very cleverly the gay PA instead of the APA. The pressure is coming from the outside, and they show up to three conferences in a row. They do this very dramatic thing one year where a, a therapist that is uh, also a homosexual, they couldn't get anyone to get on stage and say, I'm a therapist and I'm a homosexual, because they would have never gotten a job again in their life. So he put on a Nixon mask, a tuxedo that was two, five sizes too big, spoke into a microphone, uh, a voice-altering microphone, and everybody in the room got to ask their questions. And people were stunned that this homosexual was actually a therapist. And very shortly after that, the head of the nomenclature committee, um, there's a great story in my book about a bar scene where uh, the gay PA is meeting at a bar. This conference happens in uh, Hawaii. And uh, a military therapist who had never come out and had never even had the courage to visit a gay bar walks into this gay bar and sees one of the people that had been on stage, a gay man that had been on stage, Ron Gold was his name, an activist, and saw him, walked into this gay bar and started sobbing in his arms. And the head of the nomenclature committee had been invited into this very private situation, saw this scene, it finally compelled him to say, there might be something about this. And they went right back to a hotel room and started rewriting the diagnostics um, standards manual for the APA. And they started gradually taking homosexuality out of um, the, the diagnostics manual, which said it was a mental illness. So overnight, homosexuality is depathologized. It's no longer a mental illness. People recognize in 1973, by a 58% majority vote in the APA, that homosexuality is not a mental illness. So overnight, people that were mentally ill are no longer mentally ill, but it doesn't, it's so entrenched in society. It's so deep within there. Um, ooh, let's go there. Um, that's what happened in the APA. I, want, I should have gone a tiny bit more in this, uh, forgive me for going back in history a tiny bit, but we've got to get into the culture. So also during the, this Red Scare where the RSV was getting confused with communism, I, I, there was more about McCarthy. McCarthy, um, he, when he declared that the communists were in the United States, we're in 1952, when he declared the communists were in the United States, he said he held up, he was at a Wheeling, West Virginia Republican women's luncheon, and he holds up a piece of paper and says, there are 205 known communists and 90 known homosexuals in the Department of Defense and, um, and the State Department. And within a few days on the, the floor of the legislature, he conflates the two, absolutely conflates communists and homosexuals. Where you see one, where you see the presence of one, it's the evidence that the other also exists. So where there are communists, there are homosexuals. I remember as a kid, too, that I was not allowed to, there was a park, I lived on the top of Manhattan, and there was a, there's a beautiful park there called Inwood Hill Park. But I wasn't allowed to go into the hills of Inwood Hill Park because I was told that there were still, you know, so in the early 60s, there were communists in the hills behind bushes trading secrets. So and there were also sex perverts in the hills, you know, so, you know, sex perverts peeking out from behind the bush but could be communists, and they were the same. They were communists and sex perverts, were mentally ill, they were after children, and they were even worse if they had alcohol. You know? so, and they also created secret societies and they recruited. They recruited children, communists, and sex perverts. Sex fiends, sex perverts, all the same, became known as homosexuals, all recruited children. Well, the communists of the time could defend themselves in the courts, in the newspapers, but the homosexuals couldn't. So pretty soon communists dropped off the radar and our sex fiends, the ones that were threatening us, the ones that were going after children, were the sex perverts, AKA the, the, the homosexuals. 
and the reason that they were going after children was partly Freudian in the 50s, because Freud had told us, had told people, that <clears throat> the problem, why homosexuals were homosexuals, by the time he died, he didn't believe this anymore, but the ball got rolling. And it's kind of that domino effect, like Ed said, once you tip the dominoes, oh my goodness, there's still people that believe this stuff, and it's been, you know, 70 years, but people still believe this stuff. Um, Freud thought that the reason, one of the reasons, could be that homosexuals, um, they were just incomplete, immature heterosexuals. They got stuck in that child stage. So because they got stuck in that child stage, and this is going to come up again in Christian counseling, um, they got stuck in the child stage, so they were mentally and sexually attracted to children. That's why they went after children, because that's all they could handle. They were childlike themselves, so of course they went after children. Makes lots of no sense, but there you go. Um, so, so now we're going to, now when I got to this, I told you, I just ask questions. I want to know what's going on everywhere. So we know what's happening in the mental health field. We know what's happening in the culture. Well, I got curious about what is happening in the churches at all. Because I still couldn't find any evidence. There's no theology out there in this period of time about homosexuals. Yes, the word is now in the Bible for the first time, but there's no theology attached to it. So uh, just several months ago, I, you know, I get to these points where I ask a question, then ask the next question, and then it leads to another question. So my question was, what were pastors doing about this? Well, there was a, a, a magazine, a journal, and it was called, before this, there were, there were some progressive pastors. Henry, Harry Fosdick was one of them out of Riverside, I think Riverside Church in the 30s. Um, he was even challenging things like fundamentalism. He was challenging racism. And he was, he was pushing the envelope of theology to try to understand why there were things happening in social arenas. So he was, oh gosh, maybe you could say social justice. He was, you know, he was, he was pushing it a little bit. So he started wondering why things were happening the way they were. And he was one of the very first that said, I think I'm going to study psychology and my theology. So, he started doing that, and by um, 1950, and I think I mentioned this last night, 1950, 80% of the seminaries offered instruction in psychology. But this was a very new idea in the 30s. So um, the next evidence I could find in books, the only places I could find homosexuality, and I'm not even going to say discussed, but mentioned in a book was there was a... Um, Henry, Harry Fawcett Zick also wrote a book on preaching and counseling, and he wrote a book in 1946, and he referred in this book to an incident that had happened 19 years before where a teenager came into his office and said to him, I'm struggling with homosexuality, and I don't know what to do with it. And so that was the only place anything like that was written in 1946, he just mentions in the introduction to the book, this is why we're talking about these issues, because 19 years ago, a homosexual came into my office and I didn't know how to deal with it. And then no place else in the book is it mentioned. There's another book, uh, A Man on a Pendulum. I just read this book about a month ago. Thank you, eBay. You can find anything you want if you can't find it in your universities. It was written in 1955, and it was a fictionalized account of a therapist uh, but this one was a Jewish therapist, uh, J. Israel Gerber, and he wrote a fictionalized account of a person that had come to him as a homosexual and wanted to normalize his life to heterosexuality. And of course, we have to wade through 200 pages of exaggerated sexual experiences, right? Because it's got to be, even though it's a pastoral counseling fictionalized account, it's also got to have a little bit of pulp fiction to it. You know, we've got to read his, uh, his sexual accounts here. Fascinating. That's what sells the books. And it's only in the last few pages that this, this person, I think his name was John Collins, this fictionalized character, comes to accept that the best thing for him is to leave that lifestyle behind, 
get treated for his mental illness and go marry a woman. So those are the two books out there. One mentions it in a paragraph, one is a fictionalized account. But there is a journal out there. In 1950, a journal started being, a monthly journal started being produced, and I found this piece of information fascinating. And anyone I've told this to over the last several weeks, because I think I only started digging into this maybe three months ago, has been fascinated. So I expect you to be. So put your fascinated faces on. And so 1950, this monthly journal comes out. It's called Pastoral Psychology Journal. And I was curious, so I word searched. I put the word homosexual into the word search for the journals, but I put a defined timeline on it. I wanted to know 1950 when it was produced to 1972, just before homosexuality was depathologized, right? So in 1973, homosexuality is no longer a mental illness, right? Everybody's free, they're happy, the gays are... No, didn't happen that way, but 1973, it's depathologized, right? So I put in um, a word search for the word homosexual, and I got 13 hits. Okay. So that's all I got was 13 hits. So I went to all the articles, I printed them out, I tried to find similarities. Two of the hits were for a book advertisement. And the book was the book of the month for Psychology Magazine, and that was 1958. And the book that was offered was the 1957 copy of Edmund Burglar's book. If you were here last night, you may recall that I said when he died, the American uh, Psycho Psychoanalytical Association was so embarrassed that he had even been a member because he was, he was known to be cruel to homosexuals. He, the, he, I, in the book, I have some quotes from him. He was just absolutely cruel. He, I don't know how he had any clients that were, and the word would be homosexual or sexual invert. I don't know how he had any clients that were homosexual because he was absolutely cruel. So he wrote this book based on 30 years of experience with 11 homosexuals, and most of them were schizophrenic, and why wouldn't you be in a culture that was all about this? He never went out into the culture and studied, you know, homosexuals in the wild. <laughs> Evelyn Hooker had, but oh well, let's ignore that, she's a woman. So they offered to this group of pastors that dreadful book. So two of the letters, two of the, two of the 13 hits that I got were pastors saying, oh, thank you so much for that book, wasn't it wonderful? And I'm cringing. So now we're down to 11. Two of the letters were letters to the editor. One of them was basically, you know, I've got a homosexual in my church. Um, he, he's heading up the choir. Uh, what do I do about this? You know, of course he's heading up the choir. But you just leave him alone is what you do. No, it's just like, no, you send him to a professional, a psychotherapist, a psychoanalyst. It's a mental health illness. It's a mental illness. You can't deal with it. The next letter is, I've got two women in my church. They're in the choir too. They seem to be arriving together very suspect. They're going out for meals after choir practice, and I think they might even be spending time together. 1958. Is there such thing as a female homosexual? 1958. So that left me now with nine articles. I'm going to leave the last one out, the 1972 article. So 1950 to 1971, there are nine articles. And every single one of these nine articles tells the pastors that this is a mental illness or a psychosexual disease, because that was the understanding then, right? They were only mimicking what they had been told, and that they were to absolutely welcome the homosexual and comfort them. They were to let comfort the homosexual in their counseling environments, but what they needed to do was to pass them on to a, a mental health professional. Because this was a mental illness, and it was not a morality issue. It was a mental illness. Pass that person on to a professional. Love them, but pass them on to a professional. Don't counsel them, you know, from your, from your Bible. This is not a biblical issue. And it was consistent. The first time any of these magazine articles directed at pastors for counseling, mentioned a scripture, was 1972. The first time anyone said to, to, to pastors, 
This is a scriptural issue, and of course they use 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, which had just changed, right, in the, the Revised Standard Version that no one seems to notice. But in 1972, this um, theologian counselor writes an article that says it's a moral issue, and it's the first time I have evidence that a pastor uses a biblical verse to deal with homosexuality. Please put your stunned faces on. It's shocking. Because we have been told this is an always and everything that this theology has always existed. This theology has not always existed. We'll come back to this in the end, but I have to say this now. This is a new issue. We, put, we, we took verses, we can already see that. We changed them into the word homosexual or about homosexuals from acts from acts that were seen as not appropriate in the ancient world or anything before this, any acts that were non-procreative, non-male dominant, and involved lust, we hooked the word homosexual onto it, we retrofitted scripture. Now, after this, we had to create a theology around it. There was no theology around this. People were not using these scriptures against gay people. Um, so now, we're going to leave the pastors alone and because, because this is why this is an untangling the mess, right? We go, Ooh, we keep winding and winding and winding and winding. What is happening in the gay rights movement? In 1965, it didn't start with Stonewall. It starts in 1965 and it starts, um, it's called the Mardi Gras Ball and it happens in San Francisco. Uh, New Year's Eve was kind of gay Halloween and uh, gay people, trans, wouldn't have been the word transgender, transsexuals would be, would be dressing up and they'd go to the Mardi Gras ball and priests and ministers wanted to protect them. So they went to the city council and they got the permits for this Mardi Gras ball at the Cow Palace and they show up and they, they, they are standing at the door. The pastors and priests that got the permit for these homosexuals and transsexuals to have their party, and the police show up and start beating them. And it wouldn't have mattered if they beat them, the homosexuals and transsexuals couldn't have said much about it, but the priests were there. So the priests go to the city council, the city uh, commissioners the next day, and say this was completely inappropriate behavior. I'm sure the language is much stronger than that. But they start confronting the city of San Francisco about the treatment of gay and transsexual people. So San, San Francisco starts a movement, but what's really interesting is a movement starts in San Francisco where the priests, people, people want to believe that religious clergy had nothing to do with the gay rights movement at all, but they started protecting first in, in San Francisco gay people, the homosexual. And they didn't, they thought it was mental illness still. So they were just protecting people that were being beaten. They didn't understand this was okay. They didn't understand. They were not operating out of a this is okay. They were operating out of compassion. And they started opening up their churches for people to have organizational meetings. And this concept started spreading across the country. So very much in the basements of Presbyterian, Episcopalian, and Methodist churches, gay rights groups started to meet. Those in some places originally were safe places for gay people. I mean, they were not meeting in First Baptist Church and things like that, but Methodists, Episcopalians, and Presbyterians, you know, the ones that sometimes I wish I were, <laughs> but I'm not. Um, the next movement happened in 1966, the Compton Cafeteria, and this is the transsexuals, they would have said, not transgender. And a lot of these were, you know, people that didn't have the money to do transitions, and some of them had poor transitions. And so a lot of these transsexuals slash transgender women ended up being sex workers at night down in the, um, in the Castro area, in the Tenderloin District. And they would go out at night after their shift, and they would sit in the Compton cafeteria and, you know, have their coffee together and talk. 
Well, one night the cops came in and were not very pleased that they were there and started harassing him. And then the transsexual slash transgender women started throwing their purses and their coffee cups and everything. And they call it the Compton Riots. It wasn't a riot. It was just a bunch of people throwing teacups around. And um, that ended up bringing some more change to San Francisco. So San Francisco was going through some changes. And then, of course, comes the very famous one, Stonewall, in 1969. But this whole time, I mean, I have to go there, but this whole time, this one gay activist, Frank Kameny, who in the 50s, he got arrested for touching another man when you couldn't, you homosexuals couldn't touch. They certainly couldn't dance. They couldn't walk down the streets holding hands. But he was a, 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 a federal astrophysicist during the race to the moon. We were trying to beat the Russians to the moon. Well, he had graduated with two degrees out of Harvard by the time he was 17, 18. He was brilliant. He was gay. He was brilliant. What a shock. And so he ends up working for the government. He's stationed over in Hawaii as an astrophysicist. And on a stop in San Francisco, he's on a street, and he's seen touching a man. Well, he gets, they go to arrest him. They don't fully arrest him. He says, I'm a federal employee, so please don't arrest me. Why that was problematic was... In 1947, during the McCarthy crisis, we were so afraid, and in 1952, we were so afraid there were communists and homosexuals in the State Department and the Department of Defense. And in 1952, Eisenhower had passed a law called Executive Order 10450, and Executive Order 10450 said that nobody that was homosexual or suspected of being homosexual could work for the State Department, the Department of Defense, or any of the companies that held contracts with the Department of Defense. And that was 20% of the jobs in America. So if you were caught being homosexual, you couldn't have a federal job. And this had lasted through the end of the 50s, certainly. And Frank Kameny got caught under that, suspected of being a homosexual by touching another man on the street. He said to them, I'm a federal employee. I will get thrown out of the government on 10450. They said, we're going to give you a ticket and not report it to, selective, to social, not social service, the government hiring office. They said, we won't report you, but they did. So he gets called in, and he gets fired. So he's one of the first day gay activists. He's that very famous person that you see in pictures, walking on the White House steps when you could. With the, all the men were in, in um, suits, and all the women were in dresses, and they're carrying those signs that say, gay is good. You know, and it's kind of a play on black is good. They're coming after the civil rights movement, so they do gay is good. So he's that very famous activist. So activism is starting. Okay. So that's where we are. Um, activism has started. Um, it's just about to be depathologized, just about to. And now we're going to go hop back into the Bible. So we also have to remember that... No one has created any kind of gay theology. This word is just sitting there in the Bible. No one's noticing it. No one's paying attention to it. So now we're going to hop back into the Bible, and we're going to do um, Leviticus. Okay. Leviticus. Um, it had said in the Wycliffe, it said, nor be meddled with a man by lechery of a woman. Doesn't make much sense. We're going to keep going. Don't lie with a man as you do with the womankind. German Bible says, do not young with a, lie with a young boy as you would of the woman. Now your brain should be saying something here. Don't lie with a male as you sexually would lie with a woman. Don't penetrate a male. Don't put a male in the place that you put a woman in and penetrate him. Okay, that should all make sense. Next version, King James says, don't lie with mankind as you would with a woman. You put it into the context that we understand sex. So this set, remember, good sex. Procreative, male dominant, sex without lust. American Standard, the 1901 version that the RSV came out of, one of the versions it came out of, don't lie with mankind as you would woman. Same thing again. Don't penetrate a male and treat a male as you would treat a woman. Revised Standard Version, Oop, go back to me, revised. Um, don't, so this is the RSV, don't lie with a male as you would with a woman. These all make, they should all make sense. They're not about homosexuality. Don't treat a male as you would a woman. Don't degrade, don't debase a male and use him as you would a woman. So what's the next, next problematic time? 
Oh, no, that's not the one. Oh, there it is. Oh, we're getting there. 1971, the New American Standard Bible says, don't lie with a male as one lies with a female. Still makes sense. Oh, my goodness. 1971, homosexuality is absolutely forbidden. Well, that's a bit, that's a bit of a jump. Okay. Yeah, that's a bit of a jump. So let's look at those. You know, there's a lot I can say about those verses in Leviticus before 1971. I mean, that should already make sense to you, but I'm going to do a couple of more. Philo was a first century Jewish philosopher, and he said, um, he said the reason that both parties in Leviticus were penalized, well, that's a nice play on words, they were penalized and said that they should both be put to death, was because he thought that men were feminized by pen penetrating them. Okay. He thought you feminized a man, and the last thing you want to do is feminize a man. Remember that. Um, he was also the first writer to connect the sin of Sodom. So in the first century, sin of Sodom had happened 1,400 years before that, but he was the first person to connect the sin of Sodom to same-sex behavior. A lot of us can read Ezekiel 16 and say that the sin of Sodom is the, the rich being too rich and not sharing with the poor, which would be far more accurate. Josephus was a first century Jewish philosopher. He did not connect um, the sin of Sodom to same-sex behavior. He said that the people of Sodom hated strangers and they were greedy and powerful. So they disagreed right away. Um, and I would hope that you could imagine that the Hebrew Bible said nothing about how women were having sex, right? The whole thing is to care about how men have sex. Ed mentioned this last night, when you're a small tribe, and you've got to procreate to take over a land, you have to watch where you put your seed. Agrarian cultures have the seed language. You have to watch that every place that you put your seed is procreative and produces a baby. Okay. Um, some, other, some other ways of looking at it, um, we, could, we could just ignore it because it's an Old Testament law and that doesn't apply to us anyway, but that's kind of an easy way around it rather than ignore it. Let's just try to engage it. Is it because it's males are banned because they're, con they're connected to temple cultic worship? Well, there's actually no evidence of that. We say that a lot, but there's no historical evidence to support that temple prostitutes indulge in same-sex sex. If you want to go to the temple prostitutes or even a cultic worship to produce more babies, it doesn't even make sense that you would have non-procreative sex. So there's actually no evidence. Historians say there's no evidence that this is going on. Um, the Jews saw same-sex behavior as an abomination, but so did the ancient Egyptians, Assyrians, and Hittites. They all saw same-sex behavior as an abomination because of this procreation component. Um, but when you defeated your enemy as a sign of aggression and winning, you would penetrate them. You would treat them like women. You would debase them. Um, we also know that from Leviticus 18 and 20 that um, males having sex was banned. We know that. We can read it. There's something wrong with it. So, but can we apply this to gay couples today? Can we apply this aggressive use of sex, this demeaning use of sex, of using one person as a female to gay couples today? Can you apply these verses to gay couples today? Doesn't sound... Um, doesn't sound like it, it translates very well. Maybe the problem is simply that same-sex behavior is not procreative and we're, they were supposed to pro procreate. Um, could it be as simple as, again, putting your seed where it has some production to it? Okay? These are, we don't know. There's nothing that tells us exactly what Leviticus 18 and 20 are about. These are all speculative. But we do know that there's something negative associated with it. But if we put it in the, the context of what we understand, it is associated with a man not being treated as a man, but being treated as a woman, or non-procreative sex, or a combination of those things. So, and very interestingly, in the 17th century, uh, theologian Matthew, Matthew Henry said, all of these things, all these verses that we see on same-sex behavior, the thing they have in common was it was an abuse of power. In 17th century, he said that, an abuse of power. So now all of a sudden, go back to it, all of a sudden Leviticus in, in, the, in the Living Bible, 
homosexuality is absolutely forbidden. Well, I used to, when I would get to this part, I think um, one of the things that makes me a decent researcher is I'm willing to say I'm wrong. I'm willing to say, oh, that surprised me, or I really thought this and I was wrong. And we told you an incident of last night of when I was so sure when I went into the archive materials of the 1946 RSV that I was going to find this angry tussle, you know, between the translators that, you know, they were talking about the filthy homosexuals. Yeah, not, not there. Well, I was sure by the Living Bible in 1971. So here we are. So 46, the RSV, 1946. And now we have 1971 is the Living Bible. So it's right around the time gay activism has started. It's about the time that homosexuality is going to be depathologized. It's still a mental illness, but gay people are we're starting to see who they are more. So I had this other next imagination that the translator, not a translator, the paraphraser of the living Bible surely must be there must have been malice attached to that. I was sure of it. And if you go back to some of my old videos, you will hear me say it. Well, that's the point of research. See if you're right. So um, we went to, we went back to, on our trip, one of our trips, we went to, when we were in Wheaton, we went to check out the archive notes of the Living Bible. So let me tell you where the Living Bible comes from. It was written, started to get written in the 1960s by a man named Kenneth Taylor. And um, he would travel, he had a job as a salesman for Moody Press in Chicago. And every day he would travel on the train, which I took when I was there, from Wheaton to Chicago. It's an hour-long train ride each way. And on this train ride each way, he would take the American Standard Version and the RSV, but mainly the RSV he used. And he paraphrased it. And why he wanted to paraphrase it was he had 10 children. Obviously knew how to procreate and penetrate. He had 10 children. And I'm just trying to get those words in more because, I, you know, there's a prize in it for me if I hit 100 or something. <laughs> and so, so he has 10 children. And what he's concerned about is he wants a Bible that's readable to his children. So it's a very sweet, sweet idea. Um, so he... he for seven years, on the train rides back and forth, because he didn't have much time on the weekends, <laughs> he paraphrased the Bible. So he would sit, and really, he would truly, with a pen, write these notes. And sometimes, two or three verses would get on a page, because he was writing on a train, and um, the notes were pretty big. Sometimes they were smaller, they were bigger, we saw the notes. And so he... Um, spent seven years translating it, and I think he called it the first letters, the first epistles, the, it, was, it was New Testament. And um, when he got to doing the Old Testament too, so he put them together, he called it the Living Bible, and he tried to get someone to buy it. He tried to get someone to polish, publish it, tried to get someone to buy it. Big objection at the time was it was dumbing down the Bible, because it was too plain, it was not academic, he was dumbing down the Bible. So. Um, he printed the first 500 copies himself. We found the paperwork where he went to the printer in town, and the printer in town said, I'll advance you the money, and you can pay the bill as you, as you go along. And he actually went to the Bible Sellers Association conference. I, I found the paperwork for how much his table cost to rent. I mean, all of these things are in archives. You can find everything, and every little thing we find, we're so excited because, oh, look at this old receipt from, you know, 1960, and it cost him you know, $43 for this booth at a convention for the whole week. And, uh, and so he, the first week he was pretty excited. I think he sold 10 copies of the convention and then he got an order for five and, you know, it was pretty slow trickling. But what happened was a copy of this Bible got into Billy Graham's hands when Billy Graham was in the hospital convalescing from something. And Billy Graham thought it was a great tool. So Billy Graham started giving this away at the Billy Graham Crusades. It became the Youth with a Mission Bible. It became the Way Bible. I mean, when I became a Christian, that was the Bible I was given, the Way Bible. And it was all the Living Bible. So it was interesting that this was the Bible, it was paraphrased. And so it's not only problematic, that's where the Bible comes from, Kenneth Taylor. Um, but before I go to the Romans verses, 
I believed that Kenneth Taylor had some kind of malice, of course, as I said, attached to this, could not be further from the truth. When you think, when you start to think logically about these things, if you get outside your own bias, which we're always asking other people to do, when you get outside your own bias and you really see the evidence in front of you and you look at who people are, this was a very kind man. Kenneth Taylor, gosh, Luther Weigel was kind, Kenneth Taylor is kind. At some point, they're not going to be terribly kind anymore, but these guys were still kind. And he really didn't, he didn't understand who homosexuals were. I mean, even in Wheaton, Illinois today, Wheaton, One Wheaton is an organization that's protecting under, underground LGBT students, and it's 2018. So in 1970, in Wheaton, Illinois, there were probably not a lot of gay people out that Kenneth Taylor could have met. He didn't know gay people. And we even found in the records, there was one place in Second Kings where male prostitutes, his first translation on male prostitutes in the 1960s, my era, I remember this word, was punks. So it's not the word punks today, Punks was that neighborhood boy, uh, usually 16 to 17 to 18, that just annoyed people. So, like, Jerry Mahoney was our punk. And when the kids would go out to play stickball, he would just find a way to go by them and steal either the Spalding ball or the stick just to irritate people. He used to hide under the stairways when he saw me coming just to run out and scare me. He was a punk. So they don't bully you, they're not vicious, they're just annoying pests. Well, Kenneth Taylor had, in, in, had paraphrased the, the male prostitutes that were still in the land of Israel as punks. He just really did not know what homosexuals were, but it was really interesting to see how he translated. And we did indeed see copies. Um, we're trying to get the other ones, but we did indeed see the copies and the translations from 1 Corinthians 6 and from Romans 1. And there was no discussion around it. He really did go to the RSV and see that this was homosexuals. And by 1971, um, he's going to also now struggle with Romans. So let's look at what Romans is. Romans 1, and I think this is the, yeah, this, we, we end with Romans. So let's look at Romans, because Romans, first century, so now to this point, the only place where the ho word homosexual had been, right, was homosexual was in the RSV in 1946 and obviously 1952 in the full Bible. It was in the 1953 Interpreter's Bible, the commentary, right? They sealed the deal, but they also introduced Romans 1 in the commentary with the word homosexuality. But talking about Bibles, it's not in the Bible yet. Now, isn't that a surprise that the word homosexual is still not in the Bible in Leviticus and Romans by 1971? That's pretty surprising. So 1946 is a pivotal year. 1971 is a pivotal year. And as I said, I wanted to like, eh, he's awful. No, he didn't know. Another, he didn't know. But people were not educated as to what homosexuality was. Remember, it's a mental illness. So these people are mentally ill and they're doing this sexual perversion, this psychosexual perversion. They can be fixed, but they're not, doing, they're not getting fixed. So, 1971. So Romans, it's going to end up in Romans too. Romans, basically what Romans is about, the book of Romans is, you're all going to screw up, everybody needs a savior, you Israelites, Jews need a savior, you Gentiles need a savior. But what's going on in Romans, the first, the, 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 um, the quicker point to this is, um, remember men could do anything with their bodies. They could do anything they wanted with somebody else's body, as long as it wasn't another citizen, another male citizen, or a man's wife a male citizen's wife, but they could have sex with a boy, a girl, a male prostitute, a female prostitute, or a, 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 a non-citizen man. So they could have sex with all kinds of people, um, but when it came to boys and girls, they preferred boys. They preferred to have sex with boys. There's a lot of evidence in um, 
uh, writings around the time, not from the Bible, but there's a very coarse way to say it that I won't, but they preferred what would possibly be coming out of the anus of a boy to the blood of a girl. They didn't want the blood. They didn't want the blood of a girl, so they preferred boys. So boys were preferred until they got hairy at about age 20. So um, they would have sex with boys. Typically, men didn't marry until they were 30, so men would use boys and girls until the age of 30 for sexual purposes. Pretty well accepted. I think I mentioned it last night. That started to change about three or four hundred years after Christ and after Christians. Um, but the Greeks were a little bit different. The Greeks, they, and I mentioned this too, the Greeks thought the sex act was educational. So that a mom would even pick out a particular man that could mentor her son because they believed that the knowledge and the wisdom and uh, some of the attributes, the favorable attributes of a man passed through his semen so that when he would ejaculate into the anus of a boy, that boy would get some of his attributes. And some mothers so much wanted this that they would uh, manually prepare the anuses of their sons to be penetrated by men so that they could get the good stuff. Okay, that's the Greek culture. So when I also say that sexual mores change all the time, that was very acceptable then. The Greeks, the Romans, it was dominance. The Greeks, it was different. It was, uh, it was status. So now um, we can, so, but, but also uh, the thing that's important to know about this period of time was the philosophy that dominated within this period of time was Stoicism. Stoicism, Paul was actually a Stoic. Stoics believed in, um, can we, yeah, let's look at Romans. So over translation of time, it says passions of shame and natural use. These are the things that you shouldn't do. Tyndale Bible, shameful lusts, natural, natural and unnatural uses. The King James Bible said vile affections and natural, natural was against nature. If this will make a little bit more sense. What's the next one say, Ed? Um, American Standard says, with, pa with, with pa section be done with passions, and they talk about natural and unnatural. Same thing with the New American Standard, degrading passions, natural and unnatural. Shameful passions, natural and unnatural. What is the next one? Um, but we're going to get to Romans, and it's the Living Bible says that they were doing evil things. Women were indulging in sex sins with each other. <sighs> this is what it says. Okay, so we have to look at these two words, natural and unnatural, and I think that's the next one. So what's natural and unnatural mean? Some people have wanted natural and natural to mean that natural sex is penis-vagina sex. That's what some people teach this as, some people say about this, but this was a Stoic philosophy. Paul believed in it, the culture 200 years before this and 300 years after this, this is the domination. It's a Stoic philosophy. Uh, in Stoicism, oh, what a surprise. It's the same pattern, self-control, sex to procreate. I made them all S's so we could remember, and social and sexual male dominance. That's what the Stoics believed. That's what Paul believes. So that's what natural means. What does unnatural mean? Unnatural means a lack of control, lust, passion, excesses, non-procreative sex, and one or both males are not in a dominant position. Someone's being dominated. So that's what these verses mean. It's the same thing we would expect it to be. Don't use and abuse people. Don't sexually use people. Don't, certainly don't treat women, men like women. That's awful. But that's what's going on in this scene, is there's abuse, there's uh, excess lust. It is not about same-sex uh, consensual behavior by any stretch of the association. Yes. Women are doing something unnatural. Can you imagine that um, it does not, ha it could be women with women, but there are many ways that women can have unnatural sex by just following this list of don'ts. If they were passionate or excess lust, that would be unnatural. If they were doing non-procreative sex with men, that would be unnatural. Let your mind run through it, anything other than being, um, Penis, vagina is unnatural. And then the last one would really, well, the last one does. If they were using an object to penetrate a man, that would also not follow that. So 
When it says women were doing something unnatural, it doesn't mean that they were having sex with other women. It just doesn't. So when this gets translated as, what is, how does it get translated again? Where is it? Uh, women are having sex with women. It's just, it's just not accurate. Um, this Bible made, so this is Kenneth Taylor, but I'm going to contend that he still did not know what he was saying when he said, when he put, so now he's the guy that's going to put homosexuality in Leviticus and Romans. So now we're up to three verses. Remember? 1946, it's in one verse. 1971, it's in three verses. This is hardly forever and always, always has been, right? And I'm contending that these are kind of ignorant mistakes, bad translations. Can, a few things about, more about this Bible. So this Bible, as I said, it, it becomes um, the Youth with a Mission Bible, the Young Life Bible. It was the number one selling Bible, even though it's not, it's only paraphrased and not academically correct, uh, till March of 2014. Um, by 1997, it had sold 40 million copies. It was a very popular Bible. So now we're going to get there afterwards, but just here's something like to chew on. So from 1971 to 1997, 40 million copies of this Bible cell that says, um, associates Romans 1 with homosexuality and the recompense in, Ro in verses one one, Romans 1.32, it says the recompense, they get the due recompense of their sin. It says homosexuality is absolutely forbidden. Homosexual, homosexuals won't get you into heaven. All this homosexual stuff. And in the midst of this Bible being the number one bestseller, what happens in the 80s? The AIDS crisis, okay? So now they've got texts that tell us why homosexuals are getting AIDS. We're using it against homosexuals. It is just an absolute travesty. So one thing I'm finding generally true in conversation with people is how surprised you are at how recently the word homosexual was introduced into the Bible. And people will tell you that, um, well, the word wasn't introduced, but certainly the concept has been there all along. So just ask yourself some simple questions. Is there any way that Paul could have been talking about same-sex attracted people in the first century? He was talking about non-procreative, abusive sex, which wasn't male-dominated, and there was sex and lust associated with it. Heterosexuals do that stuff. Homosexuals aren't, you know, just don't have the, the corner on that market. So now we're going to start to introduce the religious right, where you get to hiss a little bit if you want to, and I'll try to refrain, but there's a couple of things that make me hiss. There's a, there's a shift in political parties between the 60s and the 80s. So with... Uh, uh, the Catholics shift over to the Republican Party from the Demo the, they shift from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party, JFK, uh, when he runs for president. Uh, a lot of the African Americans start shifting in 1964 over the Democrat Party when, under the civil rights um, movement over to Johnson because he promises he's going to give civil rights. Really interesting. He's running against Barry Goldwater and. The interesting thing about that is sometimes Goldwater is, is painted as anti-civil rights. Well, it's kind of a technicality, but he was more pro-states' rights. So he didn't want the federal government to tell any of the states what to do. So he was more about, it doesn't make his stance any uh, less um, wrong, but he more believed in states' rights. And then um, after that, Nixon appeals to the South in what's euphemistically called the Southern strategy. It's a lovely term for appealing to the white uh, Republicans of the South in an anti-black stance. Lovely terms, uh, Southern strategy. And so there's shifting in the parties. There's shifting and there's a guy that's been around since the Goldwater campaign named Paul Weyrich. And he's a little-known name, uh, un un different spelling, uh, W-E-Y-R-I-C-H, -E Paul Weyrich. 
And since 1964, when he's been a political strategist for the Goldwater campaign, he's been looking for like a wedge issue. He's trying to get people to shift back to the Republican Party. He tries a few things as a wedge issue. Uh, he tries, um, well, school prayer was popular a little bit before him. School prayer is not shifting people, taking prayer out of the school. He thinks maybe abortion as a, an issue will shift people. Pre-1970s, the only people that seemed to care about abortion were the Catholics, right to life Catholics. Um, as a matter of fact, um, the Southern Baptists, this is always a shocker to people. In 19, and this is true, 1971, you know how they love to come up with resolutions? They're not beautiful resolutions anymore, they're, they're often not. But one of their resolutions in 1971 said, the decision, promise this is true, the decision for an abortion is between a woman and her doctor. It allowed abortion for rape, incest, fetal deformity, or the likelihood of damage to the emotional, mental, or physical health of the mother. And they, in 1974, they affirmed the resolution of 1971. They're going to do a reversal in 1976. But the Southern Baptist Conference Convention approved of abortion until 1974. And they also said a baby was not, a fetus was not a baby until it was born. So they tried to politicize this issue, but it wasn't working. So, you know, for the, one of the first times, the conservative Christians got in bed with the Catholics. And if you've been raised in a conservative church, I mean, you know you don't combine up with Catholics because they're papists, right? But if you got the same target, you know, you've got the same enemy that you all don't like, you, you don't mind getting in bed together. So they combine up with the conservative Catholics because they were leading the abortion movement. Remember what I said yesterday about abortion in the 19, uh, the 1850s, 60s, 70s? It was, um, you could find it in magazines, you could find abortifacients. And that got reversed because there was a fear that the only people that didn't seem to be taking abortifacients were the Irish Catholics, and the Protestants got afraid at that time that there were going to be too many Irish Catholic immigrant babies, so we better stop abortion because our Protestant women, 20% of the pregnancies in, 19, in 1870 were ended by abortifacients in the United States, 1870. People don't know this stuff. So the, the issue becomes politicized in the 70s after Roe v. Wade. Okay, so Roe v. Wade passes. Um, and they're, st they're just trying to find some issues. The, Bob, the very famous Bob Jones tax case, uh, they try, Bob Jones tries to say that, <laughs> you know, they're not letting black students into their university, and they're saying it's a religious rights issue. They're couching discrimination. That case goes to the Supreme Court. The conservatives try to politicize that case. Nothing seems to be working to get the, the religious right motivated. Fundamentalism had sort of been intracted since the 1920s during the Scopes Monkey Trial, bigger story, but funda evangelicals split into modernists and uh, modernists and fundamentalists. The Scopes Monkey Trial happens. The, the fundamentalists kind of look like fools on the public stage. They move to the South. The Bible study starts. Uh, the Bible Belt starts. Um, more progressive people new to the north, denominations start splitting and shifting. Everybody believes that the fundamentalists are kind of going away and they're ignoring politics. They're not really. That's what it appears to be, but they're, um, they're growing their movements. They may not be involved in politics, but the movements are growing, particularly the Pentecostals. So we've got all of these fundamentalists kind of not inspired to vote, so to, the way to get people to shift into another party is to inspire those voters to register and vote. So Wyrick is looking for a, a, a thing that will inspire people to vote. And in 1978, along comes Anita Bryant. You know, a day without Florida orange juice is like a day without sunshine. She was America's darling. She was the second runner-up in the Miss America contest. She sang at both the Republican National Convention and the De Democratic National Convention. Uh, she, um, and she got, she got politicized in the 60s. When, <laughs> one night I went down this entire path on um, uh, 
lo looking at you know how she got politicized. It's just you know just go down these paths, and it's just really interesting that there was um, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember Jim, <clears throat> the one that got I can't believe I can't remember his name right now. Modesty charges. Beautiful man in the in the 60s and 70s. Jim, please somebody help me. Well. He, took, uh, he was supposed to have taken his clothes off on a stage. Okay, he didn't. Well, he, he took his shirt off, but he never took his pants off. His name is going to come to me very suddenly because he's beautiful. And um, say? Jim Morrison. Jim Morrison. Yeah. So he was, uh, and there's a story behind that. Jim Morrison was tired of being a rock star and considered to be beautiful. And here I am saying, oh, he was beautiful. And uh, he wanted to be a poet. And he felt very pressured by his publicists to do concerts all the time. He was really tired of being uh, a beautiful rock star. And so uh, they convinced him. He said, I'm quitting. And they said, no, no, you've got to do this last concert. So they ripped out all the seats so they could triple the attendance. And he started drinking during the concert. And he, they said, take your shirt off, take your shirt off. But he was drinking already. And he took his shirt off. And then people were like, take your pants off, take your pants off. Well, he was too darn drunk to take his pants off, and that was, that, that was absolute truth. But about half the people in the audience took all their clothes off and started running around. So the people in Miami-Dade County were not happy about this. So he got charged with indecency charges, and within two months there was this rally against indecency in Florida. Everybody shows up for it. And Anita Bryant shows up for it. And that's how she gets politicized at a Jim Morrison indecency rally. So, <laughs> little known fact. Um, I got all, I've got a head full of tiny stories. And <clears throat> so in 1978, her county, Miami-Dade County, votes to say, the word would have been preference. Remember I said to you last night, one of the words we used at the time was sexual preference. Her county, Miami-Dade County, the county commissioners say, that people can't be not hired or fired because of their sexual preference as county employees, okay? So you can't hire, you can't fire a teacher or not hire a teacher, a janitor, anything in the county of, the counties, the county of Miami-Dade because of their sexual preference. Well, her Baptist minister switches the story up and says, Anita, your four kids are going to be going to the Baptist school and we're going to be having lesbian and homosexual Teachers, it didn't apply to them, but it didn't matter. It inspired, it inspired her. She went up against the county. She got that reverse. She got it put to the popular vote. The popular vote sided with her, and she all of a sudden has a, a, a national platform, 1978. And she starts the Save Our Children platform. And the Save Our Children, so now, OK, 1978. It's, really funny that, like, don't people read history? Don't they read what's in the newspaper? So in 1978, she starts Save Our Children, and she starts with the old meme that homosexuals are sexual perverts, and they're recruiting our children to sex. So she gets page, uh, page advertisements in many newspapers across the country, and it's a very famous picture, very famous image. All of the crimes against children are cut out of newspapers and they're glued onto a piece of paper. And on that piece of paper, that's the ad to show us that they're after our children. And if you dig in deep enough, which I did one night, where the heck did she get this idea that homosexuals were out to come after our children? In 1972, the Democratic National Convention, Chicago, I believe, 1972, there was a convention and there were four people after midnight that held a press conference because there was no other time to hold this press conference in a distant part of the convention center to talk about gay rights. They would have been saying the word gay. The first time the word gay is really used politicized like that in politics is 1972. The Gay Liberation Front, all kinds of things like that, but that's the first time they're going to use gay. So they want to talk about gay rights. And um, there's four people on this panel. They hold this press conference. The only people that come are a couple of dozen reporters. That's it. And um, I've read accounts of this in conservative books where they keep repeating the same lies, and they say that 200 homosexuals showed up to the convention and demanded their rights. No, there were four people, two lesbians that were out, 
and two gay men that were closeted. And these four people held a press conference, and they said, we want seven things federally, we want eight things on our state, on our state um, list of rights, and one of the things they said that they wanted federally, and I think it was number seven of the eight on the list of federal rights is, this is the power of a good editor. They didn't have one. They said they wanted to lower the age of consent. Okay, that sounds like you can spin that to make it be pedophilia. What they meant by that was, like in my state, three years ago in Nevada, I testified before the legislature to make, you know, as one of the voices, to make the, our cons age of consent consistent in our state. Many states, and it still exists, the age of consent for heterosexuals is 16, the age of consent for homosexuals is 18. And that's all they were saying. They didn't want to lower the age of consent back to the 1900s and make it 10 and 12 anymore so they could go after children. They wanted to make the age of consent equal to heterosexuals, but they worded it horribly. Anita picked up on that, and that's where she got the Save Our Children campaign. Really hard to find that information, but I've been repeating it so much, and it's the truth. That's where she got it from. So she, she introduces this old story that they're after our children again in 1978. So what she does is she does two things. She's the pivoting point around the religious right movement, and the gay rights movement, all around Anita. Because the gay rights movement, okay, so it had started really in the 60s, 1965, 1966, 1969, so Mardi Gras, Compton Cafe, Stonewall, now it's depathologized, gay people are just naturally coming out of the closet, several dozen cities, by this point between 72 and 78, I think there's 60-something cities, municipalities and counties, which have passed non-discrimination acts. It had already started. So you couldn't discriminate against someone for their sexual preference. Wouldn't have said or, uh, uh, um, orientation. So she comes along now in 1978 and says they're after our children. So she starts it all up again. But the gays didn't think, even the um, National Gay and Lesbian Task Force was, it was organized, but it wasn't doing anything nationally. Because it didn't seem, there didn't appear to be a need for it because grassroots movement was starting, people were coming out of the closet, non-discrimination acts were passing, they were no longer mentally ill, everything was going in the right way until Anita comes and says this. Well, she galvanized these little spot uh, organizations and linked them together, and all of a sudden we have a gay rights movement that's organized nationally. So she is credited, if she would like to take the credit, we're starting the gay rights movement and the religious rights movement. She starts the two. So people start to realize that the ones that are trying to get the people to shift into the Republican Party, realizing that they can wake Christians up on this gay issue. And the televangelists absolutely proved that to us. Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, in their beg letters, they start talking about the dirty, filthy homosexuals. And if you see those old beg letters, they're really interesting. You know, I spent another evening going through copies of the beg letters, and the way they use the, the homosexual in those beg letters is very interesting. But Jerry Falwell, his point was to get people saved, get them baptized, and get them registered. So that year in 1980, they put a conservative candidate up for election. It's Rob, Ronald Reagan. They think this is the guy that's going to stop the dirty, filthy gays. You know, he's going to be our guy. He did, and stop abortion, he does no, absolutely nothing about either of them. And they think, well, maybe in the second term he'll have a little more flexibility. He doesn't do anything about either of those cases. I, I write, a, I, one of my favorite characters in the book, I make it sound like it's fiction, it's not, is C. Everett Koop. I write a beautiful story about C. Everett Koop. He's a, you know, when they say, you know, who are the 10 people you'd want to dinner? I said this when we were at Wheaton. I said to a guy who I suspected was, oh no, I won't say that because it's on tape. Um, I said, uh, I told a guy at Wheaton, uh, you know, he, his, C. Everett Koop's name came up because his files are at Wheaton. I said, he's one of the 10 guys I'd have to dinner. I'm like, what? So he said, why? And I tell him all this stuff about C. Everett Koop, and he said, you just love this guy. Have you ever written a book about him? No, I haven't written a book about him. But when the AIDS crisis hit, 
C. Everett Koop did the right things. He confronted the religious right and became the Surgeon General the United States needed. But by the time President Reagan said the words HIV or AIDS in May of 1986, okay, it was diagnosed, it was uh, four cases hit in 1980. C. Everett Koop was watching it. It took him nine months to get through Senate confirmations and he was watching it. He said if there was any time in the history of the United States that we needed a Surgeon General, it was right then, and he was willing to do the right things. He wasn't going to moralize this issue, it was a health issue. And he, but by the time that Reagan said the words HIV AIDS in May of 1986, 20,000 Americans had died and 36,000 Americans had HIV. That's pretty amazing. Can you imagine 20,000 people dying and your president isn't addressing it? Well, I guess you could, but... <laughs> okay. Well, that was, that, was, that was totally uncalled for. <laughs> um, where am I? <laughs> I just get so off topic. Okay, so now we're going to look at... Uh, so what are... We already looked at what the... Some of the progressives were saying about... Um, so that's Anita Bryan. So I want to, what are the progressives? Progressives are starting to look at homosexuality. They've got this pastoral magazine. What are the conservatives doing about homosexuality? So um, they're not doing much. They're not saying very much at all. They're not, you know, um, they're not saying uh, very much about sexuality at all. Um, they, they create, it's the 1970s, they create this new culture of healthy Christian sexuality. Well, if you took the New Testament and you follow what Paul says about sexuality, remember Stoicism? He believed that sex had to be towards procreation, sex had to be male dominant, and there was to be no passion and lust in sex. So they kind of create this new healthy Christian look at sex within marriage, which is not in the Bible, but they're really trying to compete with the culture because the culture is saying, you know, enjoy sex. Well, for years, nothing about sex was said from the pulpits, never mind heterosexual or homosexual, but they're trying to catch up. They're trying to catch up with uh, healthy sexuality. The women's movement has started, but you can't let the women get too far ahead. Um, so the concern at the time was the roles of women because I've said this before, before there were gays, there were women. Okay, we've got to control women. There's a great story from 1979, which comes back now to haunt people, and there was a conservative student at Southern Baptist Seminary, Theological Seminary, Paige Patterson, and he met another guy named Richard, Richard Press, Paul Pressler, and the two of them got together in 1979, and they had a conversation over their bag beignets at Café du Monde in, in, in uh, New Orleans. And they were convicted that the Southern Baptists needed to become more conservative. So they started plotting about how to make the Southern Baptists more conservative and get women out of the pulpits, too. Because before they were gays, the problem was women. So they actually bust people into the convention, shifted the, 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 the Southern Baptists to more conservative conversations, started to weed, uh, weed women out of the teaching positions and the seminaries, certain, and, and since then, the Southern Baptists have absolutely been conservative. It was a ten, but within 10 years, that went from moderate to conservative, pretty much under the guidance of these two gentlemen. If you will recall, not very many months ago, Paige Patterson was kicked out of his presidency at the Theological Seminary because he covered up sexual abuse in the past. And Paul Pressler, he was convicted or accused last year, I don't know who was convicted, of sexual abuses himself. So these are men, again, you know, one, men wanting to do whatever they want to do with their bodies. It doesn't just happen in ancient cultures. It doesn't just happen in Hollywood. It happens when you try to entrench patriarchy and you don't hear the voices of women. It's happening all over. It happens in the Catholic Church. This is a patriarchy, gender hierarchy issue. Um, but now they're trying to look at healthy heterosexuality, which is really pretty funny because that's not biblical. So we're going to leave that for, for a second and, and say, what were they saying at all? 
What were they saying at all about homosexuality? They were saying nothing. They were still trying to deal, after the women's movement, they were still trying to deal with reigning women in. And in, so the women's movement happens in the 60s. It's going to take a while for it to get to the church. It eventually finds its way into the church in the 80s. And I remember this period of time very well. This is when I became a Christian. And I didn't quite understand all the shifting that was going on until I went back and studied. So this was a time period of there were all these women of faith conferences. Women were empowered to be women. You know, we had all these all the, you know, the same women traveled the country and they were always on stage in arenas filled with you know, 20,000 screaming biblical women. You know, uh, and then in the, in the football stadiums, the promise keepers, 70,000 men, oorahing and promising to be men of God. We, they were trying to keep the gender roles very distinct. So, was there, so they were very intimidated by biblical feminism hitting the church. So feminism had hit the culture and now women in the church were asking to be, I mean, do any of you women remember this period of time? I certainly do. I had just become a Christian. And it's pretty surprising that I chose to become a Christian because I was a pretty strong woman. I had been, uh, I, when I went to school in the 70s, I went to high school in the 70s, I went to college in 74, and I went through a period of time where the 70s was like the sweet spot for women before the ERA or the, the, you know, the fight against ERA happened where women actually it was the most empowering decade I've seen for women yet. Like when I went to school, I was, uh, my college, university, had only gone co-ed four years before. I went to college in 1974, Rutgers University had only go, gone co-ed four years before, and I was the first female president of the engineering school. I mean, like, wow, that was big back then. So, uh, but I never felt like I was less than. I, in the 70s, I never felt like I was less than. And to watch this, degradation of women that's happened since then. It's just really interesting for me to watch because we too were on the way up. Gays too were on the way up. We were all on the way up. But now, so um, this healthy Christian marriage, heterosexual sex, good, this, this, this seeing the this sex positive gospel emerges. Not sure where it emerged from, but it only emerged for heterosexuals within marriage. So now we have, uh, where are we with looking at homosexuals? So now we've got three places the verses are sitting. So remember, we've got them in 1 Corinthians, we've got it in uh, Romans, we've got it in Leviticus. So now we're looking back and they're trying to when you've got, again, a yang and a yang, you're making heterosexual sex a positive thing. Homosexual sex becomes a negative thing. They had the verses, though. They had the verses. But they did not have a theology. There was no theology attached to this. The first person that really wrote, um, I'm not going to say decent, a sizable book on this was Robert Gagnon in 2001. And he got carried away. He wrote a 550, 540-something page book on the theology of homosexuality, which is pretty surprising because I don't see a theology of homosexuality. And then he became the expert on it. Very interesting. And Robert Gagnon, if you are watching, let's go. And so, <laughs> so he wrote this book, which it is so hard to read it because he just doesn't do context. He imagines, he imagines there were homosexuals in the past. My goodness, it doesn't take you long in sitting and listening to me, who has never gone to seminary, to have figured logically this out. And I'm not going to use that as a weapon against me. I'm just a person that uses my brain. I figured this thing out. Last night, our 21-year-old seminarian figured this out, didn't he? I mean, there are people that if you just take their biases away, we can figure these things out. So Robert Gagnon writes this book that becomes the, 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 the Bible of anti-homosexual behavior. And then, very interesting, a man I deeply respect, James Brownson, in 2013, in January 2013, he writes Bible, Gender, Sexuality, a fabulous book. But it is a book that goes straight up against Gagnon. He writes this book in 2013, and Gagnon's like, well, that's not right, that's not right. Well, you know what? It's been five years. If it's not right, write an academic paper about it. But the Gagnon's book falls apart 
when you put it in context. When anyone tells you that homosexuality has always been, no, please never use the word homosexuality when you're talking about the documents in the Bible. It's about same-sex behavior, and it's inappropriate same-sex behavior. So now they've got some proof texts, so they better create some theology around it. So Gagnon gave them that gift. So it's, it's interesting. So they stand here, and they invent, now this is the stuff that should irritate you, a past bias that has always been against gay people. It's a very new story, but they create a storyline that says it has always been in the Bible, it has always been about anti-gay people. When it sat here for a good 30 years, no one was talking about it. It's only when we get here that we start talking about this anti-gay theology. So they took prohibitions from the Bible that were meant for if these categories existed, heterosexuals and homosexuals alike, people that were against certain types of sex in biblical context that were abusive, that were excess, that were non-procreative, and they said that was about homosexual people. That was written about homosexual people. That is a lie. So they shift this excess and this inappropriate bad sex onto the backs of one kind of people, and they make their sex good. If you line up healthy heterosexual sex against the words of Paul, you're probably going to fa fall a bit flat. So they create a pro-sex gospel for heterosexuals, which is great for heterosexuals, right? So now, <clears throat> since the 1970s, gay people have been pushing back on this. So we, the first person we really have is Troy Perry. Oh my goodness. If you've never watched his, his uh, documentary, Call Me Troy, what a beautiful story. You'll end up crying through it. He's a very lovely man. He's a lovely, lovely man. And in 1968, he had been a Baptist, and he knew he was a homosexual. He had been married, and um, he just felt like what was going to happen. So 1968, the gay rights movement is starting, and gay people are getting beaten up in bars. And one of his best friends gets beaten up in a bar in, in LA almost to death. And he says, I wonder if I can inspire my, what a concept, what a crazy idea. I wonder if I can inspire my people to justice with the gospel, right? So he puts an ad in the advocate paper and says, I'm going to have a church service in my living room for homosexuals. Twelve people show up that first week. One of those guys actually lives in Reno. I was given a presentation one day, and he came up and he said, I was one of those 12 guys. I'm having lunch with him in two weeks. Yeah. So I'm really excited about that. But within a year, there were 1,000 people showing up because homosexuals wanted to go to church too. And the next person we have in that is Ralph Blair, another lovely, lovely man. He starts Evangelicals Concerned, uh, I think in 1973. He does not want to lose the beauty and the power of the evangelical message because he's, he's homosexual. And so he starts Evangelicals Concerned. He is still alive, he is living in New York, he really is a lovely man, and he knows the Bible extremely well, and he is very dry, funny. He is a funny, funny man. I like Ralph Blair. And the next person that comes along is John Boswell. He's a Harvard Divinity student. He writes a, a book on homosexuality, not coming to my mind now. John Boswell publishes it in 1980. It's a great book. It's a theology book. He's the first one that writes a real solid pro-gay theology book. But he gets discounted within a few years because he dies during the AIDS crisis. He dies in 1992. So who's going to listen to a dead, gay, and uh, AIDS-infected theologian? Well, people should have. But when the first person talks about a topic, often they don't get it completely right, right? So they're just opening the door, and they're just opening the door to theology. Well, he, some of his theological ideas were not solid. He talked about Romans being all about temple prostitution and all about if you're not supposed to have sex contrary to your nature, he said, I'm not having sex contrary to my nature. My nature is to have sex with men. So he simplified it. It's really you know, not good theological work, not good work within the context, but he said it. And that's going to become important when we look at the, the English Standard Version in 2001. But he does it. So if, if homosexuality is a sin, we have to fix it. 
So how are we going to fix it? Uh, the Christians come up with, uh, the Christian conservatives come up with, a, with they've got this newly manufactured um, theology that's coming up that says homosexuality is wrong. So groups come on the market, one of the first ones being Exodus. Um, but be, kind of be, as Exodus is growing, I know the, the man that started Exodus um, in 1960, uh, I want to say, oh gosh, I'm going to lose the number, 1906, maybe 70, 1972, and he started it really as a prayer group. He was like, we all have this thing, we don't know what's wrong with us, but we're going to at least pray about it. Within seven or eight years, books started getting written about how people get fixed. The gay reparative therapy movement, Frank Worthen is big in it, Anita Worthen is big in it, and they start Exodus. So they take this group that was really originally to pray for people who were homosexual within the church, and we don't know what to do with them, especially now that it's been depathologized, and they make it into reparative therapy. We're going to fix these homosexuals. So where does this reparative therapy movement? So we're talking about 1970s, the late 1970s, where we have already depathologized homosexuality. So why do the Christians get it in their heads that homosexuality is it's not a mental illness anymore because it's been depathologized? It's now a sin. Okay? So we shift it. It's now a sin. And we can do that. We don't have a theology on it, really, but we have proof texts. <laughs> we have texts in the Bible that already tell us homosexuality is absolutely forbidden, homosexuals won't go to heaven, homosexuals, um, all that nasty stuff that's going on in Romans, that's all homosexuals. So we have proof texts. We don't really have theology, but we now have, we can now say that this is a sin because there it is in the Bible, right? We know what got into the Bible out of ignorance, no malice attached yet. So uh, along comes a woman named Elizabeth Moberly. Um, and she writes a book called, 56 page book, which only in the last six months I got a copy of. Um, it was too expensive on eBay. And someone sent me a photocopy of it just randomly in a package one day. If you got all that junk, I am like the junk collector. I like all that stuff because it's historical to me. She writes a book called Homosexuality, A New Christian Ethic. Now, she has no training in psychology. She has a, a doctorate in theology. All she does is she reads people like Freud, please. She goes back to the 30s and she reads Freud, his mother, mother, distant father. She reads Edmund Burglar, the one that Nobody even wanted to be his friend at the end of his life. She doesn't read Elizabeth, um, Evelyn Hooker. She reads things that say gay people are damaged, but she says there's hope for them because these people all got it wrong, she says. Now, she's got no degree in psychology. She said they got it wrong. It's not a problem with the opposite sex parent. I know how to fix them. They all had it wrong all these times. It's a problem with the same sex parent. And we can now fix those relationships by going back and fixing those relationships. And gay people shouldn't get married to gay people. And again, um, they're not mature heterosexuals. If we can go back and fix the problem they had with their same-sex parent, we can fix them and grow them up to be heterosexuals. They can mature into heterosexuals. So the reason we shouldn't let homosexuals be in relationships or marry homosexuals, because they're both this is going to be twisted. They're both stuck in childhood stages, and we don't let marry, children marry children. Okay? This is the basis of the Christian reparative therapy movement. I bet you anything they don't know this is the basis of the Christian reparative therapy movement. It's this woman. So she writes this book. It starts passing around. One of her clients walks into the office of Dr. Joseph Nicolosi. He says, ooh, this is interesting. He's a therapist. He steals her work, and he starts practicing this work. They both end up at Exodus conferences, and they're both at Exodus conferences, 
And uh, Elizabeth Moberly says, he stole my work. He never gave me credit for my work. I want credit for my work. You either get me or him. And they said, we're not going to pick. So she walked out. She walked out. The rumor is she is still alive. I know this. I've been trying to find her, too. She's my next one to find. I know she exists. She got a copy of my letter. I do know this. But when she walked out of this movement in the 90s and moved over to England and started working in um, creative cancer cures, homeopathic cancer cures. She turned her back on this movement, and I've heard from two people that she discredited her homework, but it doesn't matter because off it went. Joseph Nicolosi stole the work, made it his own, and started, gave the Christian reparative therapy movement a textbook. He wrote that. So we have Robert Gagnon that gave them a theology and Joseph Nicolosi that gave them um, a textbook on counseling. And that textbook is still very much being sold, but noted, sold all over the place. So now, um, yeah, I want to say, he writes his book, Nicolosi writes his book in 1991, 18 years after homosexuality was depathologized. 18 years later, he's back to calling it a mental illness. That's pretty stunning stuff. So that's the, where the reparative therapy movement comes. Now the next last piece I want to hit before we go to questions, I want to see what has happened with the verses in modern translations. And this is where I have to watch myself from not getting, hmm, nasty. Okay, um, Ed, let's see, you have a slide on Corinthians, okay. What's happened to Corinthians? In the 1971, so remember, 1946, it became homosexuals. No one seems to be doing the work going back to it. So now, it goes back to my premise of my original uh, research, the question that I asked. As we knew better about homosexuality, 1973, we know better about homosexuality. It's depathologized. We don't really know. We're still calling it preference. But we're moving. We know it's not a mental illness. We know your smother mother, distant father didn't cause it. We know glandular problems didn't cause it. We know masturbation didn't cause it. We don't know why people are homosexual. We have suspicions. We will get there. But we don't know why people are homosexual. But we do know that it's not a mental illness. Until 1972, no one ever identified it in the pastoral field as a moral problem, right? So these are important things to remember. But suddenly, it's in the Bible, and it's now a sin. It's not a mental illness. It's a moral issue. It's a sin. So the Living Bible introduces it as, a, as also homosexual. Yay, not a great word. But the revised version of the, 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 the RSV, remember our 21-year-old had had that exchange with Luther Weigel and said, I think a better translation would have been sexual perverts. There it is. And when I told him the other day on the phone that the only record we have of anyone confronting them was him, I could hear him choke up when he said, do you mean that I'm the one that might be responsible for having that change in the revised vision? He said, when it came out in 1971, I wondered if my letter had anything to do with it. It had a lot to do with it. What's the next slide? Where do I go with the next one? Okay. The New International Version, another interesting one. Nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, but um, it, they later changed that to men who have men, sex with men. We went to Wheaton College and we looked at the NIV. We looked at the translation notes for the NIV. There were 64 boxes, 64 boxes of notes. We went through 64 boxes of notes. That's nothing to us anymore. So we go through 64 no boxes of notes and we not fabulously cataloged. So we went through 64 boxes of notes, hoping we could find hints of things in other places. And I can tell you that our research proved that once again, the 1978 team, this had been commissioned pretty much after the RSV came out. There were a group of people that got together and said, this is too liberal for us. We need to create um, 
a, a conservative version. So they'd been working on this a good 10 years. So they can't really look at 1978. Look at you know the 60s and what they would have understood. And so they're talking about homosexual offenders. And, but there was no malice again. This surprised me. I was sure again, because I am all-knowing, I knew it would be in the 46 version, I knew it would be in the Living Bible, and I definitely knew it, malice would be in the NIV. It wasn't. Again, wasn't. They pretty much followed the RSV. And then the 1995 New American Standard Revised says, boy, prostitutes and sodomites, pretty good. I mean, not great. But what's my next slide? I can't remember. 2001, English Standard Version. Oh, we love this one. This one says, nor men who pr practice homosexuality. And the footnote says, either partner, the passive, or the, 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 the penetrator, or the penetrated, essentially, even in consensual homosexual acts. So gone is the exploitative part. Gone is the abuse part. And people are, so it's the, the passive and the aggressive in a sexual act, but this is what I say to lesbians. It doesn't mention lesbians. So if you want to make sure you go to heaven, get yourself and eat lesbians only, because only God only likes lesbians. So make sure you get yourself an ESV, and I can say so much there, which is totally inappropriate. Catch me later, give me a glass of wine, and I'll, I'll yak. Right, right, my girlfriends? So. The message, I love this one. The message says, Eugene Peterson, who got in tons of trouble two years ago for saying gay marriage was okay and then he retracted it. Yeah, there's a story to that. Those who use and abuse each other and use and abuse sex. I think that's a much better translation. So, um, where do I want to be next? So, what our notes showed us was that the... NIV didn't have malice either. But this ESV is an interesting translation. Some, uh, some notable people, a notable person on that team is Wayne Grudem, who was also on the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, an organization I never want to belong to. And Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, when they were afraid that too much Bible feminism was, and I'm going to go over time, too much Bible feminism was coming into the church, and they recognized this in the 80s. They got together in Danvers, Pennsylvania, and they created something called the, um, the Danvers Statement. And the Danvers Statement said, all through the history of time, from Genesis to Revelation, it has been so clear that God has put men and women in their roles, that they're, they're equal, but men have their roles in the church, and women have their roles in the church, and men have their roles in marriage, and women have their roles in marriage, and this is called complementarity. Well, the word is spelled, and this is another one. This is a great story. This is a great story over a glass of wine later. See how I'm begging for, for complementarity. Okay, it's got an E here, complementarity. Complete. There it is. There's the E. Not complete. Complete. Yeah. So the night I was sitting around trying to figure, the next day I was going to write about complementarity, and I wrote it into my Google Doc, and it kept getting underlined with red. I'm like, why is it getting underlined with red? I must be spelling it wrong. So I copied and pasted it and underlined with red again. The, you know, by the third or fourth time, it finally registered that maybe it's getting underlined with red because it's not a word. <gasps> okay, if it's not a word, where'd it come from? This group in 1987 that came up with a Danvers statement that said they couldn't talk about patriarchy and gender hierarchy anymore because the women's movement had started. And women were in the church saying, we want to teach, preach, and be leaders too. No, 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 this doctrine of complementarity has been here since Genesis to Revelation. And actually, if you can't see it, there's something wrong with you. They invent a word that it reinforces, once again, gender hierarchies and patriarchy. They just call it something lovely. They call it complementarity. So Wayne Grudem is the, the co-founder of Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, one of the people that came up with the Danvers Statement. He's one on the translation team of the ESV. And he looks at Boswell's translation from the 80s, and he said, Boswell says, 
I'm not acting contrary to my own nature. My own nature is to have sex with men. So they reinforce this translation that says, consensual sex, either partner, it, it doesn't matter. This is against the will of God. So he's not, con he's not translating the words he sees. He's not working theologically through the words he sees. He's responding to uh, what he thinks is a solid objection. This is abuse of the gospel. It's absolute abuse. There are other translations. Um, where do I want to be? I think I'll, I'll head to the end so we have time for questions. One other thing. We, we, um, while we were at Wheaton looking at the NIV, we came across two boxes of notes that had not yet been um, cataloged. They'd been cataloged. Like, they're here. We don't know what's in these boxes. And in these two boxes of notes was a bunch of controversy from 2001 when the NIV was trying to do the TNIV. You know, the uh, gender neutral Bible, the gender inclusive Bible. And that didn't mean that they were going to make it God was becoming he, she, and Jesus was going to become he, she. It only meant things like all, all, you know, all the men was going to be changed to all the people. Really casual changes. Well, the conservatives that didn't like the NIV that was doing that, it was getting too liberal. They're the ones that ended up with the ESV. The conservative reaction to the NIV is the ESV. The ESV is the conservative Bible that is very anti-gay, but not anti-lesbian. So <laughs> take your pick. If you're a lesbian, yeah, go, go for it. Um, so he, there are, were two boxes of materials, much of it stamped con confidential, and there we were. But it's a public record, so we took pictures of it all. And it was, uh, we felt sneaky. And uh, there, were, there were reports that were put out, led by Dobson and Focus on the Family. They did not want this gender-inclusive Bible, so they were lying about what the NIV team was going to do. They were trying to say that they were going to take away the sexuality of God. None of that was what was going to happen. They were just going to make things all the men listened to, to all the people, unbelievably easy translations. And they just blew this thing out of proportion. They made it, um, they lied, and we could see the documents. We could see the documents. They, uh, the, the team was calling it, this is Bible terrorism. They're practicing Bible terrorism on us to try to control us. And why they were trying to control people in 1997, just before this, where they all got together, all these Bible publishers, got together in Colorado Springs, and they all signed off on this document called the Colorado Springs document, sponsored and put forth by James Dobson and Focus on the Family. And we all promise going forward that we will not do any gender-inclusive Bibles. Got to lock the women out, right? Got to make it, got to reinforce that patriarchy. And the first ones to say, yeah, we don't think this is a good idea. We think women would like to read all people instead of all men. So they buck the system. And when they buck the system, everyone comes after them. And then they decide to create an even more conservative Bible, which is the ESV. So we found those two boxes of confidential information. It was great. OK, the last thing I want to go to is the German Bible. And then we'll do questions. So the German Bible, why is she going to the German Bible? If you were here last night, if you weren't here last night, oh, well on you. If you were here last night, you, well, we reviewed a little bit. The people that were doing the original sex studies were the Germans, right? The German Jews, but basically the Germans. They were doing the sex studies. They were coming up with the words. So in 1870, they had the words homosexual. In 1881, they were debating them in their parliament. Germany was unifying. So some of the states were anti-sodomy. Anti some of them were okay with sodomy, not pro-sodomy, but not anti-sodomy. But they were debating this in their parliament. So they had the words. They were debating it in their parliament. And I told you before, the, the Sex Institute was burned down in 1933 by the students led by a marching band and then followed up by the stormtrooper. They had 30,000 records of homosexuals, and transsexual people. 
So the Germans had a fair idea about what was going on in homosexuality. And they also had old Bibles. They were the theologians. They produced tons of Bibles. Okay? So the first Bible where they deal with Corinthians is in 1534. And the two words are Malakoi, Weichlinger, weakling, and Knabenschender, Knabenschender, which is a boy molester. Okay? So there is Malakoi, which is to be like a woman, and arsenikoite, exploitative sex, and abusing someone else. Typically, it would be a boy, because we've gone through all kinds of reasons why it would be a boy. You would prefer a boy over a girl, not someone else's wife. And in 1870, look at all these dates. 1871, the word we're really looking at is arsenikoite, uh, cannabinchender. 1905, Knabenschender. They produced tons of Bibles. 1912, Knabenschender. Lustlinger, Knabenschender. Knabenschender, Knabenschender. 1936, Knabenschender. 1964, Knabenschender. Don't flip the switch yet, Ed. So, isn't this interesting that all through history, since the 1300s, they have said, Arsenikoite meant a man that molests a boy, sexually uses a boy. Pretty accurate. Pretty accurate, right? What's the next translation? 1983. Homosexuale. Now, this is really interesting. Okay. This is another fascination point. So, how we found this out is, and I'm going to give a shout out to Daniel. Daniel is a German who is a, was a missionary in China until he welcomed a lesbian into his group recently and he was asked to no longer be a missionary. And he and his wife stayed in China and started a retail business and still reach out to the LGBT community. So he's also a scholar. So he saw one of my videos from the Reformation Project, and which is the shorter version of this. There's a very, and not, not as complete, but there's an Untangling the Mess on the Reformation Project channel, which is from about two years ago, but I've done so much research since then. So he saw that, and he, he wrote to me, and he said to me, can I translate that video into German? Like, knock yourself out. You know, go mit gut. You know, go do it. So, um, so he said, he said, so he did it, and then he said, well, that was great. Can I do anything else for you? And I said, actually, you can. You can go through all the clobber verses for me. You can go through every German Bible. <laughs> You can create a table for me, and what I'm really interested in is the translation as best you can of the English of those German words. I said, I'm focused on 1 Corinthians. Why in 1983 is the first time in all of history for 700 years does this word turn into homosexual in a German Bible? That's a good question, isn't it? because they're the people that have, have been experts. Well, um, he, he basically told me he didn't know. He didn't know why that happened. So I said, just out of curiosity, who published that Bible? Because that's who you have to look at. What's the market? Who's the publisher? And he said, Biblica. And that was everything I needed. Biblica had also produced the NIV. The last time that they had any input on Corinthian, remember, was 1978 was the NIV. In 1978, when they produced this, and it, they didn't say homosexual in the NIV, they just picked, it up out of the, picked the words up out of the RSV. But since, 1983, since 1978, when the NIV came out, I'm not sure I said, just said the right dates there, until 1983, the AIDS crisis had happened. And the conservative Christian community turned on the gay community. And so the first opportunity, Biblica, this is just my assumption, but I think it's a pretty darn good one because I look for evidence. The first opportunity Biblica had to put their stamp of homosexuality or anti-homosexuality into a Bible was this 1983 Hoffnung for Alles, Hope for All, <laughs> except the homosexual. And uh, for the first time in history, Schender, boy molester, turns to homosexual. It's a travesty. It's an absolute travesty. So ending here, I want to say 
uh, there's more to say, but I want to say that we are going forward and digging into translation work still. But what I hope that people can gain from this, not just people in this room, I hope that it's been enlightening to you, and I hope that it frees some of you up, but the people that watch this later on, that have no agreement with us, that are not taking affirming stances, that do not want to be inclusive of LGBT people in the church, because the Bible clearly says. I'm hoping, as I said at the first part of this, that I hope with this framework that I've offered, that I can lift you up higher so that you can look across history and look at the foundational truths of roles of men and women and what sex looks like and how important procreation has been and how important gender hierarchy and patriarchy have been and you can look and say, I think she's telling the truth about these things. And hopefully you can then take the next step in honor and say, maybe if we take the Bible, if we just take the beauty of the gospel, take the Bible, the words of the Bible, and lay them just in this framework where they belong on this historical line. And then challenge yourselves to say, does what, as what I've been told really accurate about what these verses say. And if they're not accurate, that I could just find somewhere along this teaching of these last five hours, if there's somewhere inside of you that says, I may have been wrong, not me, you. <laughs> perhaps I'm wrong about this, or perhaps I've had assumptions or myths about this, and she might be right if I can find just a little place to enter into that crack with some truth, that's all I'm hoping for. I don't expect people to fully shift, although often they very much do. I just want, in particular, conservative Christians to say, I might be wrong. I might not know everything. Because as I said, we have taken verses that have been changed so conveniently for us, we had the verses and then we created the theology. That is just, that's absolutely a crime. So um, that's my intention, that's one intention, is to help you to understand that this is not about LGBT people. But the other one that really makes me more, I guess more passionate, is the Bible is beautiful. The gospel is beautiful. And in the midst of all this mess and this ugliness and all these lies, we have buried the beauty of the gospel that is there for all. And it is a hope for all. So that's the other thing. So I want to free LGBT people and their families and the church to love these marginalized people. But you know what? I also want to free the gospel from the burden that has been put upon it, because I do believe the gospel is hopeful. So for those listening, 